Hi, Abby. Hello. Thanks a lot for, for accepting this, uh, this, this discussion. And I'm delighted uh, first to talk to you and to be able to articulate a bit uh, some of the messages uh, and the, the key points of uh, this book, which you have written in English. It's third edition uh, being published in, uh, in Routledge, uh, Illness, the Cry of the Flesh. And uh, so the French translation has been has recently been published in Vrain. And the first question I, I wanted to ask you, Javi, is what is the, the main subject of the book? Thank you, Thomas. Um, the book is called Illness. And for me, the um, invitation from the, the publisher was to write a treatise. So a, a personal essay of about 45, 50,000 words um, that tackles a subject from not uh, from the perspective of academic philosophy, but from the perspective of life. And I was very happy when I uh, received this invitation um, because I was just before that diagnosed with a, a lung condition called LAM or lymphangioliomyomatosis. Um, and I was very preoccupied with trying to figure out um, not just how to live, but how to live well with a, a, a serious uh, a condition that is chronic, that is going to stay and be part of my life um, for, the, for the rest of my life. So uh, I wrote the book during a three month period, fairly recently after my diagnosis uh, back in 2006. And the book uh, then uh, came out in the first edition in 2008. Um, so the main impetus was to try and understand illness from the perspective of philosophy, but not really to use the maybe more um, familiar uh, philosophy of science tools, trying to talk about you know, uh, knowledge, causation, uh, randomized control trials, um, evidence and so on, but really addressing a more, if you like, humanistic set of questions that have to do with um, how does one live with an illness? How does one experience illness? How does one relate to other people once they are ill? So the social aspects of it uh, and the relationship of um, uh, the ill person to their environment. And I, I thought long and hard about which kinds of philosophical methods would be most appropriate for this. And I ended up using the, um, the approach called phenomenology, which uh, of course should be um, very familiar to the, the French listeners um, that originated with, with Edmond Husserl um, and was later on developed by great French philosophers such as Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, um, Simone de Beauvoir and, and, and others. So I guess the, the project was for me to explain to other people what it was like to be ill in a way that doesn't, if you like, collapse into, on the one hand, the mechanistic and biological or naturalistic medical model, but on the other hand, also avoids the pitfalls of uh, cliché and social scripts that we find in a lot of people's discussions of illness. For example, the social script that illness is uh, always and only a bad thing. Um, for example, that people who are ill deserve to be, you know, pitied in some way, those kinds of things. I wanted to tr try and keep away from all kinds of uh, generalizations and stereotypical thinking about this issue to try and really explore the first person lived experience of it. So you're, you're, you're saying it's important to avoid merely reducing illness to a biological dysfunction, uh, something that also has been called a, a naturalistic account, or avoid some of the social scripts that are uh, associated with illness, which are often negative. But what I'm curious about also, and I think this is something that is fairly clear in your book, but I'm also curious about, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a more a more positive understanding that the phenomenological approach uh, can bring to illness and or what, uh, because you you mentioned 
the phenomenological approach to be to be your philosophical method to understand illness. Uh, how does it manage to both uh, avoid some of the pitfalls, let's say, of uh, traditional understandings of uh, of disease, but also what can it positively contribute to to an understanding uh, of illness and of its experience? Yeah, thank you. I think the key is to try and let each individual develop their own understanding. So to see the experiences of illness as something that is completely idiosyncratic. Now, of course, you know, many cases of diabetes are very, very similar to one another, biologically speaking. Um, so there is a tendency, I think, to generalize and to say, well, one diabetes patient is like the next. But I think the idiosyncrasies come at the level of the person. So we have to appreciate that how, but how somebody lives their illness, how they experience it, how, and, and it, of course, it's, a, it's an experience that can last you know, many decades, right? So starting from how they experience the symptoms when they first appear, how they, what sort of diagnosis experience they have, how they then experience the remainder of the illness and um, all of its ups and downs was very important for me to find a philosophical method that enabled you to really hold on to the sense that the authority lies with a with the first person perspective. And not only that, but that there is something really valuable for health professionals, for medicine, to understand about that experience. And of course, ultimately, everybody's goal is to make uh, being ill and receiving health care easier for people. Um, so the way to make it easier is to, first of all, address the issue of what is it like for you. And in that sense, I think resisting the, the generalizations and resisting the social scripts is, is very important. So people can learn, I think, or can use phenomenology to uh, hold on to that first person perspective. And that's one thing I tried to do also in another thing I developed, which is a, a patient toolkit for, which is aimed at people who are ill, really to use some basic ideas from phenomenology without the, the terminology, which is, can be quite tricky, but to, um, to use really the principles um, of, the, of bracketing and of take this idea of, of being in the world to enable people to think about how their being in the world has changed as a result of their illness or how they can um, bracket the social understandings of illness or the naturalistic understanding of illness and create an understanding that is 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 their own understanding and that that is productive and positive for them so i think that's really the positive feature of phenomenology which is quite political in a way is that it, it can empower the individual to give a voice to their own perspective and to their own experience and i think this uh i think this is this leads quite organically to, to, to one of the concepts you defend in the book, which is to uh, avoid, let's say, in, in many biological and social exceptions of, of the distinction between health and illness, people conceive it as, a mutually, exclusive, as, as mutually exclusive categories. So if you're healthy, you're not ill. If you're, if you're ill, you're not healthy. And um, I think what follows from what you're saying is, uh, is that there's also the possibility to find spaces of, of uh, health uh, within illness, uh, or at least to um, develop tools. So you're talking about the patient toolkit uh, to develop tools inspired from phenomenology to let also um, patients redefine their experiences of, of their own illness and to also allow an understanding of, of, of their own health, even within uh, experiences of, uh, of chronic uh, illness. And I, I wonder if, you, if you'd like to expand on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a very important point. So the idea here is something that you can call health within illness or wellness uh, within illness. And this is an idea that crops up um, to, to an extent in the kind of empirical literature about um, how ill people um, live and what's, what sort of a level of what sort of quality of life or level of well-being they have. 
And again, this is kind of the division between what I call the insider perspective and the outsider perspective. So I think the outsider perspective on illness sees it as a very monolithic thing, as something that is, is very negative and something that is stable and steady in its, in its essence. So it's a bad thing and it is always and only a bad thing. But actually, again, returning to the, to the first person perspective, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prism that can, that can color some aspects of your life, but of course, um, they're not all necessarily negatively colored. So for example, one thing that is noted in the empirical literature is that people who are ill often have uh, improved relationships with people because they have more honest and intimate conversations and connections to people. So to see it as something that is just a loss is I think, again, too, um, too reductive, too black and white. And what we really need is a much more nuanced understanding of the spaces within life where you can experience yourself as living well, even if you're ill or disabled. Um, but of course, this isn't to erase the, um, the pain and the suffering that arise from illness. It's just an attempt to say it's a much more diverse experience than just saying it's all bad. Now, I think when uh, going back to this idea of the outsider perspective, when people look at it from the outside, all they can see is the negativity, the disability, the things people can't do, the things they've had to give up. But when you look at it from the inside, people have a remarkable ability to adapt and to find solutions to practical problems and to live on, you know, even within the context of, you know, severe illness and, and disability. So, you know, maybe they can't ski anymore and they might instead do something gentler like Tai Chi or yoga. Uh, maybe they can't, uh, you know, work full time, so they will work part time. Um, but really the, the remarkable thing about, you know, human psychology is that we adapt to things, even things that are, uh, that make quite a profound impact on our life. Now, this adaptation is a, a phenomenon that's recognized in the, in the empirical literature. But again, um, it's important to see it in its complexity. So adaptation doesn't mean that you become blind to what you've lost or that you no longer uh, see that you're actually <clears throat> living a very limited life. The adaptation is the ability to live within the constraints but still live a valuable and positive and worthwhile life. And again, that's quite a lot more nuanced. And I think um, the insider perspective is the one that allows you to see how somebody has, you know, weaved their existence out of the limitations of, of illness. And even though people give it a lot up and make a lot of sacrifices and have a lot of discomfort or suffering or disability, that doesn't negate the fact that that life is one in which you can still experience well-being, joy, happiness. So that's why it was important for me to articulate this idea that especially within the context of chronic conditions that people live with for a long time, there is a, this uh, space of wellness within illness. Okay. Um, but I think, uh, Tomai, it would be really interesting for me also to hear about uh, your decision to to translate the book and okay. what how that came about so first and foremost uh this the the, the translation of the book is the result of a, of a personal encounter uh the encounter i uh, have had with uh, you when i visited uh, bristol back in 2014 and uh and I remember we we had this uh, conversations conversation about um, many different to topics uh, in philosophy of medicine, and you gave me I think what was the second edition of of illness, and um, and I've read it probably in the weeks that followed, and it's a, a, a work that uh, touched me emotionally in many ways, which uh, I think resonates with uh, many important questions, which are Firstly, conceptual, but also existential, with the the relation to to death, with the relation of uh, with 
with aging, but also with how we adapt to different conditions. Uh, and this is something that I, that I would like to ask you after that about the, the specificity and the universality of the of, of the experience of illness as, as an existential experience. So, so it, I was really fascinated uh, by reading also how uh, how the um, how you weaved your personal experience and uh, conceptual analysis, which is something that I think is 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 done so well uh, in in this book, uh, because it it gives uh, it makes it accessible and it makes it uh, able to 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 resonate with. Uh, with people that are not necessarily familiar with uh, with, with uh, the philosophical literature, and uh, and I think this is a, this this also fascinated me in let's say in a, in a professional way as as how how to write something that uh, is conceptually relevant as a philosopher, but that is also uh, accessible and and existentially relevant to to anyone that is being uh, anyone concerned by by the topic you you are you are discussing and that's pretty much everyone actually what happened is that i had uh, let's say a window of time before i started my my thesis uh, in in the summer of 2014 and quite candidly i i thought okay uh, let's try and translate the book so you you gave me permission but i had uh, no editor at the time so and I quite candidly, because I thought this would not take a long time to happen, uh, the the reality has showed me that it, it did take eight years to get to get published, and uh, and I'm thankful for Touvrain for that. Um, but yeah, it kind of started on uh, on on let's say um, this intuition that it was a book that resonated in, in important ways for me and that I thought translating it would uh, bring it to to yet another set of audience uh, and, and another linguistic community so the French community uh, and and for an academic and non-academic community uh, and and I was really the, the first intention was was also that was to to make it avail more broadly available because I think its message is is, uh, is important to bear. And, uh, and and so I launched myself in the in, in the in the project and uh, there there it is after many years of uh, of uh, reviewing of uh, negotiations and, and and all of the uh, all, all of the processes of publishing a book and I'm delighted uh, to that we can discuss it today uh, basically yeah well you took you took a big um gamble translating it before there was a publisher so oh. in, in, in many ways it is it is your you know your tenacity that that made the french translation happen so i'm really grateful to you it mattered to me and and once the the project was started it was also an important thing to me to make it finished on top of of course all of what what took so long as well is that it's a project that what was actually a side project from my PhD research from the from from my own work, uh, but I've always also been happy to to work on it again, to review it again, to to find new corrections, to find to to let's say to refine it, uh, and and that was a uh, yeah that that was a great process to go through. And so one of one of the thing I I've, I've I've said I think also in in in, in with respect to to your answer. Uh, and I, that I wanted to to hear more about is uh, is that I think there's a great uh, there's a great universality of the book in terms of uh, it, it talks about it talks about illness but it talks about uh, po po possibly other life experiences as well uh, and it's also a reason for instance as uh, let's say as a person that has not been going through uh, chronic illness. Uh, can also relate uh, a lot to, to what's to what's going on, um, or to what you describe. Uh, and so, what I what I wanted to ask you is uh, to to expand maybe a bit on 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 whether there is uh, or what is the specificity of the illness experience, or if there's other elements that are specific to illness, uh, and at the same time. Uh, 
also expand maybe on on uh, on the the universality of, of of this experience. So, what can we learn? Basically, another way to phrase it is: uh, what can we learn through illness? And you've partially responded to this, but also what can we learn through uh, reading your book? And through reading your book, not necessarily about illness. Yeah, good, very, very good question. Um, I think primarily what is um, unique to this experience is that it's about your own body. Um, and that's true in the positive sense and in the negative sense. So in the negative sense, um, you're, you're stuck with it, as it were. There is, there is nowhere you can go to have respite from your, from your illness. You, you don't get a break. On the positive side, there is an understanding that uh, that experience will be an embodied experience in a very, very powerful sense, and that it will be a very rich bodily experience of, of various kinds. It will be rich because it will uh, possibly push your body um, to have experiences that go beyond everyday experiences, experiences of surrender, of helplessness, of pain, of anguish, terrible experiences, but certainly ones that kind of broaden the, the spectrum, if you like, of, of bodily experiences that we have. The second sense, uh, what I mean by positive isn't that they're, they're good experiences, because by and large, they're not good experiences, but they are experiences that um, I think can make very salient to philosophy, the extent to which our embodiment is so crucial to who we are and how we live. So I think in those two senses, again, um, phenomenology really, really came to mind. And in particularly, I think the work of uh, Merleau-Ponty, because um, for him, as he famously says in Phenomenology of Perception, the body is our, our medium for having a world. There is no other connection we, we have to the world outside our bodies. Um, so, of course, when that connection is disrupted, one's whole life is disrupted. Uh, and one's entire life world changes. And that was really a very important insight for me uh, that I wanted to share with other people, this idea that illness isn't just something wrong in your arm or in your kidney or in your liver or in your heart. Illness is something that happens to the whole of you and has an impact on the whole of your life world, if you like. So in, in that sense, I was uh, really struck by how useful and how apt the, these phenomenological concepts were for our understanding of illness. And that's why, um, you know, I, I think why the book uh, maybe resonated with, with people who don't necessarily have any exper prior experience of philosophy, because really the concepts are almost as if they were crafted for the case of, for the case of illness. It's key for, for patients to improve their own understanding of what's going on uh, during the illness, uh, and and to I think in this in these cases uh, these philosophical concepts uh, kind of work as a as a as a light uh, as a as a sort of a focal lamp uh, to which uh, through which we can uh, start emphasizing or highlighting uh, elements that uh, we might not necessarily be aware of. Uh, if we are not being invited to look at it. Uh, so, so I think in this case, uh, phenomenology works uh, wonderfully for, for, for the understanding of the, the experience of illness. And one of the, so, and one of the things I, I think is also uh, salient in your book, and I think it's implicit in what, we, what we've just said, is, is uh, how um, dedicated it is to uh, make the connection connection between uh, life and philosophy, make the connection between abstract concepts, uh, abstract discussions, things that sometimes uh, appear uh, disconnected uh, out of uh, out of the life experience or, or mere intellectual games, and connect philosophy and its concept with the experience, the everyday experience of, of living and of living with illness. I'd be curious to, to hear a bit more about uh, how, do, how you think uh, you've managed, and I think you, you've managed really well to, to fill in this gap that can be sometimes be, that can sometimes be felt. Uh, what was your approach here to, 
to address or uh, to address this uh, this, this feeling of discrepancy yeah yeah um again that was that's a that's that's a, a, a great point and something that was really important to me um i mean it goes back to this really strong intuition i had when i was diagnosed because i remember thinking i've spent all these years studying philosophy what use is it to me if it doesn't help me at a time of great, you know, personal crisis. Um, and when I started looking at the philosophy of medicine literature, um, I found that a lot of it was really a conceptual analysis of the concept of, of disease or of the concept of health. Uh, a lot of it was sort of philosophy of science as applied to medicine. And that I was really seeking something different, something that would um, guide me or give me um, give me intellectual support uh, to 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 be able to navigate through this this crisis of, of, the, of finding out that I was ill and to find a way forward with that. So it was really a very um, primitive quest, if you like, saying me saying to philosophy, I I need help. Um, mm -hmm. And then really it was um, what took me back to the, these French phenological texts primarily was precisely this idea that because they devoted so much time to understanding embodiment, they were, they were there waiting to be applied to illness. They were there to be, um, to be used for the case of illness. And I found that they were very illuminating. Now what happens, the result of illumination is that, of course, you feel more secure and more grounded in your own position. So they're also very useful in a very practical sense. You know, if, with, with, I felt that with the right concepts, with the right interpretation, with the right set of, um, um, you know, reflective tools for thinking about illness, it can help to make sense, to order, to validate experiences that are otherwise very chaotic and are very, uh, very difficult, of course. Um, so anybody who has been ill, seriously ill, will, I think, know what I mean. The all very sudden uh, way in which you're withdrawn from your normal life, the loss of independence, of autonomy, um, sometimes of dignity, and of course, the, the very, very re real sense that your body is betraying you, that your body isn't um, doing what it's supposed to be doing and how come it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So there's a lot of questions, some of them existential, some of them ethical, some of them political, um, some of them even metaphysical. And I think these questions are not just theoretical questions, they're questions that um, people ask because they are looking for a way to live with illness. So I think the answers are really um, a very good exemplar of, of this idea that philosophy can be useful for life or it can be a, t a tool for better living. How you insert yourself in, in the legacy of ancient Greek and uh, Roman philosophy, uh, which emphasize uh, the tight link between uh, conceptual and philosophical thinking and uh, living a good life. And that philosophy should be about uh, contributing, uh, that it should be about helping people uh, living living a good life. So I would be curious to, if you, if you could expand on that. Yeah, so again, um, another French philosopher, Pierre Hadot, was very um, very influential for me because I think what he tried to do was to combine um, classic scholarship with an understanding of how philosophy can be a way of life as his, his famous uh, collection of essays is called. So yes absolutely I mean there has been a recent uh, very powerful revival of, of stoic philosophy um, you know Martha Nussbaum famously used this idea that philosophy is you know medicine for the for the soul uh, and, and other philosophers have, have, have picked up on this idea and I think it's really really core to what I was trying to do in the book 
because what I was trying to do was to say philosophy can work in the service of life because it can give us, I mean, again, there's lots of different approaches, but one that really, I think, suited me was the one that says, if we have the concepts and we have an interpretation and we are able to make meaning out of our situation, then we can um, proceed with, with, with trying to, to make it, you know, tolerable, livable, even, even a good one. And of course, ultimately, the challenge here is to say, can you go beyond that? Can you even flourish with illness? Can you flourish in a, a, a life context in which your body is, is, is impaired or damaged or dysfunctional? And again, if, if you think about it, this is not a very uh, classical philosophy of science question. So I hope this gives a flavor of what I, mean, what I meant in the beginning when I said it's a kind of humanistic approach. Because mm. ultimately I thought philosophy here should be helpful, should be useful, should be a tool for people who want to, who want to live better. And again, there's uh, a great tradition of doing exactly that, starting with Epicureanism, and, and stoicism and, and ending up with you know today in this this revival every time i open my um my home page i have another article about how stoicism can help you know uh, modern life and so on so i think it's a it's a beautiful thing to see a, a philosophical tradition thousands of years old that was initiated in a in a completely different uh, geopolitical situation social situation our technological situation and to see to see the relevance to see the continuity to see to see how ultimately um what the uh epicureans and the stoics were seeking namely you know um tranquility of the mind is still something that we are very um very busy trying to achieve in 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 many ways mm. so so in that way i think the additional kind of bonus of thinking about it through the lens of illness is to say you can achieve tranquility of the mind even in situations where there is no tranquility or um, completeness or functionality of the body. And and I I, th I think this also illustrates greatly what you what you said right at the beginning and that you that you just highlighted is that we will lose something. Uh, and I think this is central to your argument. Uh, we would we would lose something if illness is merely discussed or conceptualized or, or understood uh, as as a biological dysfunction that has to be understood with science. And as you say, if we do philosophical analysis, then it would be classical philosophy of science tools, which I think, of course, is important. Uh, and, yeah. and, and I have reasons to believe that philosophy of science is important. But also, what you've uh, mentioned about the let's say the the, the wisdom of of the uh, antique greek and, and roman philosophy is that it it also highlights how uh illness is uh to be understood as an existential experience that includes uh how to live a good life how to have a healthy relationship to finitude and the possibility of death uh what can be sources of tranquility uh and and of course in in the context of your book within, uh, let's say, the dysfunctions of the cells of uh, the body, where can we find still sources of, of tranquility? And, uh, and, and in, that, in that sense, I think this is also a great contribution. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, th I think, again, the, this ancient emphasis on contingency, on um, how ultimately we don't control what happens to us is, is really such a core lesson for the illness is offering to, to teach us again in a, in a, in a painful and, 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 and sad way. But nonetheless, you know, there are sort of epistemic gains or there are um, existential lessons that can be had from illness. And that again, goes back to my point that you can't just see it as something that is just negative. You can also see in what ways it's it's edifying, in what ways it can bring about positive changes to one's life, in what ways, you know, given that we have 
um, only a limited ability to defeat or to, to conquer illness or to cure it, in what sense we should uh, look for ways to coexist with it in, in, in a way that is, um, again, that doesn't close off the possibility of a good life. Yes, and uh, to also tie it with um, some, of, some of some of my personal interests here, uh, I think this uh, defense of uh, this, and let's say this enrichment of uh, the, our understanding of illness through a phenomenological p perspective also goes back and, and, and raises challenges to scientific understandings of, uh, uh, of uh, what illness is, what its experience is, and what we should do. we should, um, let's say, address the pain and the suffering of the patient or, or improve our medical services. Uh, and um, I think that this, uh, the fact that, that uh, one has to take into account uh, the first person perspect perspective, I think is at the same time so crucial, but also um, so daunting, let's say, when we take it seriously uh, in, in how we then uh, change it, change our uh, the way we produce knowledge about its patient, or we change, let's say, improve or modify clinical trials, uh, in or we improve or modify uh, clinical interventions uh, in ways uh, that they become even more, even more, let's say, caring or relevant to to the patient experience. And uh, and from an epistemological point of view, I think this is a absolutely fascinating question. At the same time, a necessary challenge. But also a fascinating question on, on how we do it or how we do that. More generally speaking, I think it raises the, the question, which is also a, a, an important question in philosophy of science: is exactly how uh, how we give a voice to situations that are voiceless, or how we integrate voice, voices uh, accounts uh, that are not so far uh, taken taken into account by our usual ways to produce knowledge. And I think uh, a book like yours is a, is a great contribution to uh, both defend the need that we that we need to give voice, and that's something you said at the very beginning that we that we give a voice to the to to the patients, and we have your voice. But I think it resonates with many other voices of people experiences chronic illness, and then how we and raises the challenge of how we fit this voice in the current. Uh, medical institutions, in the current social institutions, in the way that we live with people with illness, in the way that ill, that Ill people live their, their daily lives. And, uh, and I think in, in, in this case, this is at the same time, both a, a great, uh, an important point to make, but also, also a great beginning of a conversation uh, about the topic. And that's also one of the reasons I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to have this book available to to another linguistic community is that it can it contribute to expand this important conversation to uh, different contexts and social and cultural contexts. So I'm very grateful for for you to have uh, to have written that. Oh, thank you, Thomas, and thank you for um, for uh, being in conversation with me. You're welcome.